Um, okay, so um, just to remind everyone here that uh, we, we want to give uh, Dr. He a chance to explain what he's done uh, in terms of the, the science in particular, but also uh, other, other aspects of, of, of what he's done. So please, can you um, allow him to um, speak without in interruptions? Um, as I said, I have the right to just cancel the, the session if, if there's too much um, noise and interruption. Um, and I just want to state a couple of other things. So first of all, that we, we didn't know um, the story that was going to break over the last couple of days uh, when um, he accept, accepted the invitation to come and speak to us. Um, so we didn't know this story beforehand. Um, uh, in fact, he had sent me uh, the slides he was going to show in this session, and it did not include any of the, any of the work that he's now going to talk about. It was sort of preclinical data, but not, nothing uh, involving human, embryo, human embryos uh, that were implanted. Um, and I should also state that um, you know, we're in a venue. Uh, we have very generous hosts, Hong Kong, Hong Kong University, University of Hong Kong. And our hosts have also, they have a, um, a strong tradition of allowing free speech. And so we are complying with that, uh, that tradition of, of free speech. So anyway, I would like to, um, if you can hear me, ask uh, uh, Jiang Kei uh, to come to the stage and, and present his, uh, his, his work. I don't know where he is, so hence the... Uh... Okay, thank you. <clears throat> uh, first, I must apologize that these results leaked unexpectedly, taken away from the community of the full data being presented immediately in a scientific venue. And through a peer review process engaged before this conference. So this study... It's very disturbing for everyone here if you're taking photographs. You stand still, you've already taken photographs, you don't look at it anymore. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so this study has been submitted to to a scientific journal for review. I also thank the Associated Press, who we engaged months before the chain's birth, out of a commitment to the accurate reporting the study's outcome from many points of view. I also thank my university, although they are unwell of the study's conduct. So, Winnie Herbert, I should also thank you for your statements now and the wisdom that shared with me, as well as the community for discussing this data and providing this forum. I'll give an overview of our data, focus on human and monkeys. Despite wonderful progress in HIV therapy and access to this therapy. New infections 
remain three times higher than the UN AIDS 2020 target. So HIV remains a top 10 cause of death in several countries, in particular developing country. For uninfected children born by an HIV positive mother, who know make up a large percentage of births in area of Southern Africa. The risk of being infected by HIV in the first few months of life is many, many times higher than other babies. This is a, a serious unmet need, as an infection's severity is often made even worse by discrimination. So a copy of a natural protective ID against HIV infection is carried by as much as about 10% of the population in several European countries. This ANI leads to the first functional cure of HIV and decades of clinical trials, making this natural small deletion in CCR5 gene one of most studied variations. And the CCR5 gene are one of the most we first explored the impact of CCR5 gene lockout in mice to investigate the multi generation effect. Editing was efficient as expected. We established a third generation CCR5 long mice, which we confirmed by Western blood and flow cytometry. Tissue pathology was normal in heart, liver, lung, and stomach. So two common behavior assessment showed no difference. We then assess whether this set should get RNA against the human CCR5 gene could be designed. So we assessed seven. I highlighted one that occurred at exactly the start of data 32 mutation. It has an MIT specificity score above threshold, predictive of having no target activity. A few previous publications has assessed the same or similar GetRNA in multi-cell type including non-variable embryos. <clears throat> SG4 induced the most efficient editing activity in a cell line and the 3 pn human embryos. Since this target site is conserved in the monkey genome, we could use the monkey as an animal model to assess the SGRN further. We found injecting the castling closer to fertilization promoted the most efficient editing efficiency, consistent with the Cas9 required 10 to find the target loss and its degradation over time. The rate of fertile eggs forming process was not affected by exposure to Cas9, which we observed across experiments. So sequencing of the process quadrant confirmed earlier Cas9 injection also reduced the mosaicism. To look more closely on the mosaicism, we also sequenced every individual cell in several embryos. Editing appeared to occur at the one, two, three cell stage. On the assumption that Cas9 degrades quickly and requires time to find the, the right target, we explored a strategy 
to reduce the mosaicism by delivering a second injection of castellan to an embryo at a two-cell stage. The development of eggs to the blood cells was not impaired. We expand the sample size, which confirmed this previous observation. We still observed the variation across parents and the cycles. We then looked to see if this protocol could translate to human embryos. We found, as others have reported, the Kessler protein was the most efficient delivery format. Lowering the dose compared to the monkey embryo also improved the efficacy. Upon the advice I received after presenting early results at the February 2017, the UC Berkeley Genome Editing Workshop, we edited non-variable embryos and established the two embryonic stem cell, cell name. So both are bionic lockout and the karyotypes are normal. Embryonic stem cell marker expression was normal by staining and the flow cytometry. This embryonic stem cell also found all three germ lines during the 14-day EV experiment, which is a marker of safety. Another serious safety concern is off-target. Embryo editing target a single or few cell stage of life. Any off-target would pose very serious consequence and extend potential through the whole body. In adult gene therapy, off-target are expected but a less healthy problem. We assessed off-target initially by single-cell whole genome sequencing of embryo prior to the implementation. We used the isothermal MDA amplification method to minimize the false positive rate and for unbiased coverage. The Milton-Pov lab used the same approach, which take a step further by sequencing the parent genome to detect off-target risk sites that exist only for each parent and a particular embryo, but not in the reference genome. We create a, a pool of off-target risk sites by first collecting all any sites mentioned in previous publication. We add the genome sites for the unbiased assessment of a potential cleavage site. And, and in silico prediction, such as the MIT CRISPR design, uh, both the original and the 2018 updated version. Finally, we import the parent genome, which allow facing to improve sensitivity and uh, detect the larval risk sites unique to each embryo, which may emerge from inherited Intel or SMPs. So all this loci found a personal pool on the order of 10,000 spots per embryo. We use whole genome sequencing to assess for the spot and validate any findings by single sequencing. I will review genome sequencing data with the data on the new and nana as focus and end. Of the potential cleavage sites identified by the genome-wide unbiased digenome assay, 
known was observed in the whole genome sequencing data. And no activity was observed at the risk sites identified uh, by the 2018 version of MIT technology, MIT CRISPR design software and the original version. We explore off-target in the HESC cell name generated from added embryo. Although we didn't have access to embryo with the, the parental donor's genome, we identified one potential off-target. This off-target is in the intergenic region, although we cannot uh, confirm whether this is an uh, inheritance or due to editing. So here you can see the editing efficiency across 19 viable embryos from volunteers. So we performed PGD whole genome sequencing across the embryo and didn't identify the off-target sites. So in one embryo, we identified a uh, six KB deletion at the untargeted sites. It did not affect any gene but the CCR5. The CCR5 genes distance from other genes protect against the risk of large deletion. We detect the large deletion by us assessing for the chimerical reads and the visual confirmation. Now I will focus on the Lulu and the Lala's genomic data. We sequenced the genome of both parents to confirm the target size conservation and to support off-target detection. The mother was HIV negative. The father positive with undetectable viral load. So the XC and the sperm washing was used to prevent transmission. At day five, so we have few cells were sampled from blood sites for PGD. We follow on these results during the pregnancy by self-free DNA after the mother declined and amino synthesis. So Lulu and Nala were born normal and healthy, with upcon score eight and nine. After birth, we sequenced several different tissues. So in this Mark and Greece first AVF cycle, pre-implementation genetic diagnosis from the two blood sites were edited. One was a bionic fringe shift lockout, which should shorten the CCF protein, similar to the natural protective variation. Another has an in-free deletion in one and E. The deletion expects to destabilize local protein structure in the nearby HIV binding sites. The parents were informed of implementation of this in related to HIV infection and remind them the option to leave the trial without implementation or to choose the wild type embryos. The couple elected to implement this embryo to start a two embryo pregnancy. In addition to the single data, we also reported to the volunteer whole genome sequencing data. The reads cover that more than 80% of the genome. The whole genome sequencing identified one off-target in the MAC-based re intergenic region 
far from other gyms, with no known coding RNA and transcription factor binding sites. The volunteers were informed of the risk of posed by the existent one potential off-target, and they decided to implant. <clears throat> After the mother declined aminosynthesis, serial cell-free DNA of blood test didn't observe the intergenic off-target from PGD. Another cell-free DNA test found no larval cancer gene mutation. After birth, the deep sequencing of the cold blood, which is primarily the baby's blood, confirmed editing pattern observed during PGD and cell-free DNA. Sangal sequencing also confirmed this observation. After birth, both my sick deep sequencing and Sanger sequencing did not detect intergenic off-target observed during the PGD. This suggests it was an artifact of a single cell amplification or a mosaic off-target that happened to occur in the few 12 plus cell sampled for PGD. For whole genome sequencing, we did a 100x cold blood and 30x on the placental. No off-target were observed genome-wide. Neither were large deletion. We will continue to assess the effect of editing in the twins, including testing a blood sample for susceptibility to HIV infection at the P3 biosafety nav. We also further investigate the off-target effects and the mosaicisms across multiple tissues. And the plan to monitor the twins' health for the next 18 years with the hope that they will consent as adult for continued monitoring and support. Thank you. Okay, so what we're going to do is, is have a little panel discussion, just the three of us, to make sure that the, the details of the science are, are well understood before we open it up to some general questions. Okay. Um, so Matt is up here to help me with this. So Matt, do you want to start or shall I start? Okay. Um, the, you obviously you chose to work with CCR5 because you, you felt that this was um, a, a valid first uh, um, gene to, to target um, in this, with this approach. Um, but do we really know enough about CCR5 and its, its function? Because as you said, that there are naturally occurring mutations. There are many, probably millions of people who are naturally have mutations in the CCR5 gene. They're mostly northern... European, or well, that's the, thought to be the origin of it. It's very infrequent, at least the Delta 32 mutation is very infrequent in, in China, for example. So that could, be the, that, uh, that could reflect either that it never sp spread here from Northern Europe, or that it's selected against in China. Um, so it's known that it, ha having mutation in CCR5 protects against HIV infection. But does it predispose to other 
complications. So West Nile virus, we know there's some evidence to suggest that increase that. And then just a long question, I'm sorry, but I will answer that one first. What about other things? There's also a suggestion that maybe influenza, um, so patients with CCR5 mutations may be more susceptible to severe effects of influenza, mm. which would be bad in this part of the world. Okay, so we choose the CCR5. It's for multiple reasons. So the first, it's a, it's, it's a, uh, HIV, it's a lethal disease in several developing countries. And also this HIV exposed but uninfected children not became a new global challenge. And uh, their study in Zambia, also, also study in China, show that the, the, those HEU children may get affected from six months to 18 months in this one year period with a possibility of uh, 0.5 to 2.5 percent. So that is a significant uh, number uh, compared to the kids in general. And so for this gene, we have studied for decades and there's multiple clear trials on that. And uh, also for the Western layer and the other uh, potential set effect this. So during the inferred consent, it was written down to inferred there will be Western layer virus, not infections. And also in your 18 years or even longer monitoring program, there's a, a West near virus uh, detection regularly. And, <clears throat> do you want to follow up on that? Well, shall I? I, I want, want to follow up a bit more on that. So, um, so this is, the CCR5 obviously must have a, a function in the immune system where it normally operates, yeah. which is not, nothing to do with HIV. The immune system we know has effects throughout the body, and that in, includes the brain, right? It's known to affect aspects of functioning of the, of the, of the hypothalamus, pituitary, the, the uh, other aspects of the brain function. Um, you cited your own work on looking at well, some evidence to suggest that there was no effect on, on behavior or, or cognition, but there has been another paper published a couple of years ago suggesting that actually mice with mutations in CCR5 have enhanced cognitive ability. So that poses an, an issue because have you inadvertently caused an enhancement at the same time as, uh, as, as dealing with this? So um, do you think we really know enough about CCR5 and, and its role in the immune system um, to choose that as a first gene? Uh, okay, so the first is, uh, 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 I against uh, using the genome editing for the enhancement. Uh, second, so the study you mentioned, uh, uh, I saw the paper, and uh, I believe it did more independent app verification. Uh, and also for the uh, CCR5, uh, we start this. Uh, a reason is, uh, another reason is, uh, we should start with some simple, well understood, single gene has become a conservative first model so that maybe in the future you can move on to multiple gene, more complicated genotypes. Okay, well, Matt. So thank you for your clear presentation. I think there's going to be some questions about um, some of the numbers in the process. So for example, how many uh, couples have you consented? How many eggs have you obtained from each mother? How many embryos have you attempted to modify? How many then had the correct modification? And then how many were attempted to be implanted? And then how many actually gave way to birth? So what's the pipeline that you have done in, as part of this project? So there are in total eight couples enrolled for this study. And um, one dropped out. And for the remaining seven couples, uh, this Excuse me, and they were all similar in father was HIV positive, mother was HIV negative? Yes, yeah, so the criteria, uh, criteria requires the, the father to be HIV positive and the mother to be HIV negative, and plus some other age requirement. And so 
uh, so for all the couples, uh, they after inferred consent for multiple rounds, um, uh, inferred consent with the scientists and uh, also with the team members, and uh, then under the, the normal IVF procedure, so um, collect eggs and then <clears throat> we inject casnet protein and get on the. And if, sorry, how many eggs total between the seven couples? So uh, in total, we have uh, about 31 follow sets. For that number, it's, the, yeah, it's 30, yeah, 30 embryo plus sets. That are yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So 30, 31 were injected. Uh, it's, it's more, I mean, what well, I mean, 30 developed to plus that stage. And with that, about 70% of the embryo were edited. 70% had biallelic editing or 70% had monolelic? And what was the percent mosaicism in those 30 embryos when you, well, that's right, you wouldn't know because you only took one cell. Yeah. yeah. So, and then, uh, okay, so why did you decide on these two rather than the other 24? Uh, this, this couple happened to be first to be pregnant. Have you subsequently implanted the remaining in the six other couples? So it, uh, the clinical trial was paused due to the current situation. Okay. Okay. I have one other thought. Um, can you, I'm from the United States, so I'm not yeah. completely familiar with um, how the review process. So how did you go through, who did you discuss this trial with in terms of your supervisors, mentors, um, other people, in terms of getting feedback on the trial design, the consent process? Who, tell me sort of the scope of the team that was involved in designing this clinical trial. Okay. So when I start this, uh, even from the preclinical study, uh, uh, I first talked to a couple of scientists and doctor to find out uh, CCR5 is the one to recommend. And uh, then uh, once I have uh, some early data on the preclinical, I presented uh, in the Cold Spring Harbor lab meeting in New York in 2017. And uh, also in the user Berkeley Genome Editing Conference, so some of the audience also in that conference too. So I, I get feedbacks, uh, positive feedbacks, and also criticisms, and also some constructive advices. Uh, and I continue to talk to not just scientists, but also the, the top ethicists in the United States yeah, at Stanford, like Winnie Herbert, as mentioned, multiple times talk. And uh, also I, I show my particular data to many scientists, uh, physicists. Uh, when I started a, a clinical trial for the, yeah, for the inferred consent, it's a, we, just, we take the NH guideline as a reference and uh, draft the inferred consent. And then later was reviewed by a US professor. Uh, and when the, it's a, a pregnant, uh, this inferred consent was reviewed again, so we had a subsequent uh, a supplementary material for the inferred consent to add the, the long-term follow-on plan. Uh, and when, yeah, and also, let me, let me go to that. How many, how many people read the informed consent before you showed it to the family? How many people reviewed the informed consent and felt like it was appropriate? Uh, so outside of my team, there are about four people. Four. Okay. And the, when this couple was in full consent, the, the, uh, it's, there's an observer, uh, observer uh, from the United States professor and also a Chinese professor in the Chinese Academy of Science. And it, it's oh. audio recorded. Yeah. So on, on the informed consent issue, uh, was that the gained by a, a, an independent person talking to the patients, or were you or your team involved in that process directly? Mm. That's including the first round, this uh, 
uh, team member uh, went to talk to the volunteer first for two hours. Uh, and then after about one month, mm -hmm. the volunteers came to Shenzhen. Mm -hmm. And I personally, together with two another professor, uh, give up one hour and 10 minutes in front consent. But you were, the, so you were directly involved? Uh, directly the, involved. The, they were, because yeah. after one month, they actually yeah. bring out the papers, see off-target, CRISPR things, okay. they already information on that. And one more question, maybe even upstream. Um, how did you recruit these couples into your study? Was it done by personal connections? Was did your institute put out a uh, release? So how was the recruitment done of these particular couples? It's uh, by a uh, uh, HIV and AIDS uh, volunteer group. Okay. Um, I think what we should do now is is uh, well start opening up for questions from the floor, but uh, David Baltimore wants to say a quick word um, first, if possible. Yeah. Um, so then, when I come to taking questions, I will take questions from the general participants um, who are lined up. Um, I will also um, take, have, I have questions uh, from the media, so I have a lot of questions. <laughs> um, uh, many of them are the same, um, so I'm not necessarily going to say who asked the question because they're the same questions. Um, and, but actually also quite a few of them uh, have actually been answered uh, during Dr. Hay's talk, so I probably won't bother with those either, but I'll be quite selective. But first of all, David. I, I want to thank Dr. Hay for coming um, and for being responsive to the questions that have been asked. Uh, I still think that the statement that we made uh, at the end of the last meeting, which is that it would be irresponsible to proceed with any clinical use of germline editing unless and until the safety issues have been dealt with in this broad societal consensus, basically an open process, uh, that that has not happened and that it would still be considered irresponsible. Uh, I don't think uh, it has been an, a transparent process. We've only found out about it um, after it's happened and after the children are born. Um, I personally don't think that it was medically necessary. Um, the choice of the diseases that we heard discussions about earlier today uh, are much more pressing than uh, providing to one person some protection against HIV infection. Um, I think there has been a, a failure of self-regulation by the scientific community um, because of a lack of transparency um, and uh, the, I'm speaking here entirely for myself. Uh, the committee that uh, organized this meeting will be meeting uh, and issuing a statement, but that will not be until um, tomorrow. Tomorrow? Tomorrow. tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> um, and why, why don't we continue? Okay. All right. So yeah. let me take, so start off with maybe David Liu from. Hi, David Liu from uh, the Broad Institute, Harvard, and HHMI. Uh, first, I'd like to echo uh, uh, David Baltimore's comments, thanking you for coming here under some unusual circumstances. Um, I'll uh, limit myself to two questions. First, I just don't see the unmet medical need for these girls, because the father is HIV positive, the mother is HIV negative, you already do sperm washing, and thus, you already could generate uninfected embryos that could give rise to uninfected babies. So could you first uh, describe what is the unmet medical need, not of HIV in general, which I think we all appreciate, but what is the unmet me medical need for these patients in particular? And second, um, you justify the critical decision of implanting these embryos to generate a human pregnancy with the decision made by the patients as opposed to made by 
the scientists and the doctors and the ethicists, can you also comment on uh, what is our responsibility as scientists and doctors and uh, independent communities to make that decision for the patients rather than allowing patients to make critical decisions uh, like that uh, uh, seemingly on their own? Thank you very much. Okay, so the first uh, guess whether CCL5 is a med uh, medical need. So, <clears throat> okay, uh, I truly believe that uh, it's, this is not only just for this case, but for, for millions of uh, HEU children. They need this uh, protection since the HIV vaccine is not available. And uh, I have personally experienced with the uh, some people in the some AIDS village where 30% of village were, uh, people were infected. They have even have to give their children to their relatives or uncles to raise just to prevent the potential transmission. And also for this specific case, I feel it's a, I feel proud actually. I feel proudest because uh, the mark thought it, he lost the hope for the life. But when the baby was born and with his protection, he sent a message at the day of birth, say, I will work hard, earn money, and take care of his two daughters and his wife for his second half life. So. Let me, can I ask, before we get to Dave, the second question, um, you said that um, there's been no other implantations, but just to be clear, are there any current pregnancies with embryos that have been genome edited as part of your clinical trials? There is a, another one, but it did tend to monitor. There's what? There's another potential okay. pregnancy. It's very, it's very, yeah, I think it's a, you said a very early stage, so it's, yeah. It's, it's a chemical pregnancy, rather than... Yes. But in the interest of the transparency. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, well, let's... Sorry, let's we do this side first, and then I'm going to ask a question from the media. So, go ahead. My name's Evan Kirksey from Deakin University in Australia, and I, I have a two-part ethical question. So, first, I was wondering if you could just slow down a little bit and talk about the institutional ethics process that you say that you went through. Um, so, looking to the past. The, the second part of my question is really about the future and, and how you understand your responsibility to these children. So your last slide indicated that you're going to be doing some follow-up treatment. So just an invitation to slow down a little bit and, and talk about your responsibility towards the future as well. Okay, so let's just uh, ask it, not you, but people here, your question. So do you see your friends, your relatives, who may have a survival from the genetic disease. So, uh, for what I see, those people, they need help. We should, for millions of families with uh, this disease, inherited disease, or be exposed to infectious disease, we should show passion, compassion to them. And if we have this technology, we can make it available earlier. That would be help the much more people for this view indeed. So when talking about the future, uh, what I mean is first that it needs to be, first it's a transparent, open, and uh, share what I, the knowledge I accumulated and, uh, to the society, to the world. And then let the society decide what we should do, to do in that step. If I might, my question was actually much more specific about the actual children, not an abstract question about the future, but going forward with, with these children that have been born, yeah. it, how do you understand your responsibility to them? I mean, it relates to actually a question from the, questions from the media, a set of them, which is basically, you know, thing, questions like, you know, will you publish the identity of Lulu or Nana in the future? Um, to, how are you going to prove the effect, effectiveness of the treatment if the, if the two individuals uh, remain in secret? Um, 
But, of course, you have this conflict between you really have to protect patient identity in this case, um, but the world wants to know, will want to know whether they are healthy, whether the method has, uh, has any negative consequences or positive consequences. So how are you going to deal with that? Uh, so first, it's against the Chinese law to disclose the identity of the HIV positive people in public. Uh, okay. uh, second, so uh, for this specific couple, it's on the careful monitoring health. And uh, I think I would propose that it's the data or, or the information should be open to necessary regulatory and uh, all necessary to uh, maybe a civil panel of experts. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, okay, let's get a question over the side. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Zhang Tianzhe. Beside my work, I also as a founding member of Inter International uh, Law and Technology Interoperability Association. We discover about uh, law and technology and the future of legal profession. There are a lot of questions has been collected from our members, but I only ask a few uh, globally. Yeah. One, uh, the first one, one question, please. Choose a good one. Okay. Okay, um, the good one, I think everyone is great. So uh, the, uh, the most important one is like, um, we are curious, how, would you, how did you convince the, the parents when you, um, when you, uh, when you uh, started this experiment? Did you tell them like there's alternative solutions, for example, other ways of to um, avoid of, um, of AIDS infection from, of their child? Uh, and se second, uh, it's about how did you done the ethics review? How many institutions has been involved and how was the process? Thank you very much. Okay, so the first question, uh, how we convinced the, the patient, uh, this volunteers, they all have good education background. So they know pretty much uh, a lot of information about the HIV the drug, all this alternative approach to them, or even the latest research articles published. This is common, as all the HIV infected people, they are usually in a social network together. Well, the latest uh, advance in HIV prevention treatment information is available. Uh, so when the, the volunteer come to the informed consent, they already understand uh, quite well about uh, the genetic technology and its side effect or potential benefit. So it's, uh, I think it's a, it's a mutual exchange of information that made the, uh, like the volunteer made the decision. Can I ask a, a question again that goes back to transparency? Is would you be willing to post the informed consent, obviously the generic informed consent, and your manuscript in preparation in a public forum so it can be reviewed, um, such as on BioArchive or on a publicly available website for the informed consent so the community can um, read in detail about what you've done? Would you consider doing that? Yes, actually, the informed consent is already on the NAP site, LAMP website. You get to search my name, you will find it. I have an English version there, so you can read it. Mm -hmm. Second, for the manuscript, uh, even I, when I draft the manuscript, there are already about uh, 10 people outside my lab. A few in the United States helped me to edit the manuscript. When it's ready to submit, I also send out for uh, several to give comments. So I uh, originally want to uh, submit to BioArchive. It's like second my plan. Uh, but uh, some advices from some people told I should go up here review first before it's posted on file archive. Yeah. So I took that advice. I, the, the, <clears throat> I think you took that advice, but would you change your mind now? Because I think the circumstances have changed. And I think, you know, the, as you can see, there's a big demand to know exactly what you did. You don't have to answer that now, but just yeah. to say, okay. yeah, you should think about that. Um, let's take uh, a question here first, and then I'll do another one from the media. Hi, I'm Anna Middleton, and I'm Head of Society and Ethics Research at the Wellcome Genome Campus in Cambridge. I'm also a genetic counsellor, and I'm very interested in the informed consent process. So if I'm understanding you right, there's a 
there's a consent form that you're happy to share now. It was reviewed by four people and there was a conversation that lasted about 10 minutes with the patients. Um, given that we know, particularly in the UK, that the average reading age of the general public is around age 10 and that the vast majority of the public don't understand what the word genome is, I'm quite interested in what happened in that conversation and how you explained what the risks were and what evidence you have that they actually understood. Okay, so, yeah, I can describe that. First, uh, I don't know if I uh, can correct your thing of 10 minutes, and it's correct, it's one hour and 10 minutes one for this couple. One hour and 10 couple. minutes, okay. Uh, so what happens, it's in a conference room with uh, this couples, me and two observers. And uh, the print copies was given to the couple before uh, the different consent. Do you know that they could read them? <coughs> did you know that they could read them and understand them? Oh, I didn't get that. Did, did you know that they could read okay and understand what you were saying? Yeah, they are very educated. Yeah. Okay. And uh, yes, so and then, uh, so each of take this uh, inferring consent. I explain from page one to page 20, line by line, paragraph by paragraph, and uh, and they have the right to ask any questions during this consent. They get, and uh, uh, so the, yeah, once the, we go through the entire uh, inferring consent, at the end, uh, I leave them uh, to private discussion. So you have uh, freedom and time to discuss uh, the couples, uh, and also they have the choice to decide uh, today, or you could take it home and decide uh, later. So were any of the team actually trained in taking consent? Or was this the first time you'd actually had conversations about this? Oh, sorry, you get were, were any of the team that took the consent, were they trained in were the process of dealing with consent yeah. issues? Were they trained at doing what they were asked to do? Uh, so, okay, so as I said, I have two rounds of uh, different consent. The first round is a team member. It's a post, I mean, I have the, it's, a kind of, it's informal. It's just informal conservation uh, for two hours to talk to this person to explain. The second one is the formal ones. It's I personally ex explain that. So uh, uh, I do uh, read the guidelines from the NIH on the inferred consent, even, be, even when we uh, drafted the inferred consent. Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, well, okay, question from, from the media. Um, can you uh, please explain the source of the funding for this, uh, this work? Okay, okay so uh, when I started this, uh, uh, I, was, okay, I was a professor at the university. So the, when, three years ago when I began this, uh, the pre critical study, the university uh, paid the salary and the, of the uh, regions of this for pre critical study. So when uh, move on to clinical study, all the, all the this patient's medical care expense was paid by myself. And uh, uh, a small amount of uh, sequencing cost is covered by uh, my startup funding in the university. Okay. So there was no funding from industry or from a company? Because you have, just to make it clear, you have a, an involvement in a company. Yeah. But that was not involved in this project, is that true? The, neither of my company was involved in this project uh, right. by providing funding, yeah. people, space, or equipment. And what about, the, and did the, the families uh, pay anything or were they paid anything? So was there any exchange of, of money? Uh, so it's all written down in the inferred consent that we pay all the medical expense, and uh, they are not uh, receiving much extra money for that. Okay. okay. So let's have uh, this side, sorry, questions. 
Hello, Dr. He, I'm Li Mengying from the University of Hong Kong. And since there is lack of the evidence to delete this kind of gene or make it silence in human, and as a scientist who should be responsible for the patient, may we know your future medical care plan for these babies? For example, how would you give them the vaccine scheme? And also, the uh, more important thing is, how could you evaluate their potential mental health? Because they have to be under the very strict or abnormal supervision in your team. Thank you. How are you planning to monitor the medical health of the babies in terms of vaccinations and neurodevelopmental outcomes? Yeah, so with the long term, uh, the healthy follow on program, uh, the informed consent is posted on the uh, website of my lab. So it's clearly the state uh, on which each year what examination will be performed, uh, including development of the neurons. Uh, regular blood tests, all these information, and plus the HIV infection, West Dale infection, all this information. So it's all available in the, uh, in the in front of consent. Okay, Sorry, thank you. Okay. Question here then. All right, uh, Wen Shengwei from Peking University of uh, China. Uh, I have a technical question regarding the off target uh, assessment. You mentioned you did this uh, single cell whole genome sequencing. As, I, as far as I know, there's no reliable or mature technology to conduct the so-called single-cell whole genome sequencing. Uh, so this is the technical question. Second is, uh, there's a consensus uh, for to, to, to not allow to conduct a genome editing on a germline a cell. This is consensus between the international community, including the uh, Chinese community. I assume you are very well aware of this. Uh, this is a red line. Why you choose to cross this line? Uh, hypothetically, if you don't know, why you perform all those uh, clinical study in secret? Uh, so can you explain? OK, so the first about the off-target by the sequencing. So uh, uh, before implementation, we can only biopsy three to five cells from the, the blood cyst. Uh, from that, we amplify the, uh, for the single cell, it uh, compared to book cell sequencing, the, we get a, a less coverage on the whole genome. So for the book cell sequencing, we may get 95% of genome coverage. For uh, single cell, uh, the number of cells get 80 to 83 percent of uh, coverage of genome. So that's the current uh, state of art. Uh, and uh, that means that uh, there may be a that's that missing. Uh, uh, but we, we gain the confidence. It's not a, just look at uh, this embryo. Uh, that means we already did uh, many of them. By combining all this data together, we get to uh, understand how uh, how much off-target will happen. So, uh, so the, yeah. yeah. So, the, so the second part of the question, which is also questions I had from the media, yeah. which is essentially why so much secrecy ar around this, when, particularly when you know that uh, the general feeling amongst the scientific community is that we shouldn't go ahead yet in doing this. So why, why is there so much secrecy from, for example, uh, the Chinese authorities? Um, so, you know, you, you know the accusation now is that you've broken the law. So if you'd involved the Chinese authorities as you were doing this, they may have said, you can't do it. But you, you went ahead without really discussing with people. That's how it seems. Uh -huh. Okay, so uh, as I said, uh, I have been engaged in, uh, in the scientific community uh, three years ago, uh, publicly speaking, the whole spring harbor of a particular data and Berkeley and also in Su Zhu also has a, a host of Asian con conference uh, and the constant get feedback uh, from them. Uh, we uh, moved on to clinical trials. Uh, I also consulted with uh, several experts in the United States for the ethics and also uh, this science. So, and also the Chinese uh, people there. Okay, well, is it Maria next? Sorry, yeah. Maria next. So, um, Maria Jason, Sloan Kettering uh, in New York. Uh, immediately, for me, it uh, raised uh, 
many scientific questions, um, but also a very personal dynamic for these two girls. So uh, that I think if it, things have been thoroughly vetted, there may have been a, a proper discussion of. But for example, um, there are two sisters, one of whom I assume now is um, refractory to HIV infection. Uh, and that was a desired outcome from the parents, or at least the father you specifically highlighted. So with, within the family dynamic, are these two daughters going to be treated uh, very differently? And then the other side of that, or related to that, is um, the one girl that is refractory to HIV infection, is she now going to be desirable for breeding, for you know, <laughs> uh, will people, will, will this change her, her whole dynamic in terms of marriage and children because a spouse may be uh, particularly interested in, in getting this mutation within uh, the family? So, um, you know, even this very simple thing with these two girls being different in the family and, and, um, and now uh, this being something of an enhancement, preventative um, trait, not just a, um, a, a d disease correction, but now something new that could be introduced into the population. Yeah, it, it's, it's more on the, I think it's only philosophy thinking of this. So uh, I have reflected deeply on this. Uh, that's why uh, I want to publish the a five core value for you know, editing uh, that's including in specific, uh, related to what they are talking. First is respect the children's uh, autonomy. So uh, we're not uh, using any uh, these tools to control their future, their expectation, or what they're going to do. Uh, and uh, uh, it's to give them freedom of choice. And the second one, is, uh, we say it's a gene don't divide you. It's uh, the children so that we should encourage them to explore the full potential and uh, pursue their own life. The life is right by the children itself. But for 18 years, they're children, and uh, they, they don't have that autonomy. Now their, their genotype may uh, quite affect their upbringing. Do, do, you th do you think the fact that their genome editing is going to affect how they see themselves as people? Uh, Not even perceive themselves, how their parents perceive well, them, how their relatives well, they, perceive they, them. They will know, presumably, at some point, that they have been edited. Uh, right. So it's going to be yeah, very unique. I don't know how to answer this question. Mm, no, okay. I think, so, uh, we, we, I'm being told that we're going to have to stop the session very soon. I'm just going to ask, I'm really sorry, but I think we're... You, you, We'll have to, uh, I just want to finish off with two questions from the, from the media, which have, uh, again, uh, some of these have been repeated several, several times, um, which is really, well, first of all, did you expect all this fuss? Did you expect all this reaction? Because you were, you know, even, even if you had managed to succeed in your aim of having the paper, uh, you know, reviewed and published first, um, there would have been a lot of a fuss at that time as well. So did you... Did you anticipate this? Uh, it's because the, the news leaked out, it became all anticipated to me. Because yeah. uh, uh, my original plan or original thinking is based on the survey of the United States or the US, the, uh, the British, also as the ethic statement that, or the Chinese survey that's given uh, us the signal that uh, the majority of the public is uh, supporting using the human genome editing for treating, including the uh, HIV uh, prevention. Uh, prevention. Okay. And then the very final, final question. So, um, okay, if this was going to be your baby, would you have gone ahead with this? <laughs> okay, it's, uh, that's good. So if, if it's uh, my baby may have uh, the same situation, I would try it first. All right, so I think we should thank uh, Dr. He yeah. for his um, appearing here and uh, uh, thank you.